we don't feel like we have enough and we can't figure out why. And one of the reasons why is we give it away to a financial system designed to take it from us. We surrender it to our master MasterCard and other consumer debt. We normalize sayings like, well, we'll always have a car payment and we're paying interest on items that lose their value the moment we drive it off the lot. Paying interest on stuff that loses its value, it causes our margin to shrink. So let's go against the grain and work a plan to pay off the debt. All of these keys are found throughout the pages of the Bible. I'll share these keys and I just want you to pick one that you can start today, turn it this week to start your journey to break free from being broke. And so here's the first key. Have a written plan for your money. The financial world calls this a budget. Jesus actually said this to a group of people. He said, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. This is what happens when we don't have a plan for our money. A budget isn't a bad thing, it's a great thing to have. Pastor John Maxwell says, a budget is people telling their money what to do instead of wondering where it went. A budget forces us to be intentional with our money. And winning is an intentional act. You never hear a post-game interview after the Super Bowl where the quarterback is asked, well, how did you do it? And he said, I don't know. I just threw the ball wherever and we won. It doesn't happen. Every winning team puts energy into a game plan, they execute it, and then they win. And this is what a budget does. We form a game plan, we execute the plan, and we win. A budget gives us a plan for how we're gonna break free from broke so we can win financially and be generous. And the first time my wife Andrea and I worked together to put together a budget, it was actually a freeing process because we weren't surprised by bills anymore. We knew what to plan for and when we were going to get paid. And just by writing out a plan started to give us some margin, which this margin helps us with the next key. And that key is get out of debt. Now I know this seems crazy and very countercultural. It's normal to live with a lot of debt. However, the Bible gives us this warning about debt. In Proverbs, the author says, the borrower is slave to the lender. Now here's the picture in a lot of homes today. We make a lot of money, enough to be in the top 1% of the world. And yet we don't feel like we have enough and we can't figure out why. And one of the reasons why is we give it away to a financial system designed to take it from us. We surrender it to our master MasterCard and other consumer debt. We normalize sayings like, well, we'll always have a car payment and we're paying interest on items that lose their value the moment we drive it off the lot. Paying interest on stuff that loses its value, it causes our margin to shrink. So let's go against the grain and work a plan to pay off the debt. And I know this is hard to do because we have to tell ourselves no for a while, but it can be done. I know couples here who have had hundreds of thousands of dollars in consumer debt, and they decided they had enough. They fought for freedom. They began to work a plan to do what's called a debt snowball, and they worked more to increase their income and slash spending so they could pay off their debts one by one. And it usually took a couple of years of really hard work, but now they're out and they said, hey, our stress and our fights about money are gone. We're so much closer now as a couple and we have so much more peace because we took the steps to get out of debt. They broke free from broke and guess what they found? They have the ability to be so much more generous now and experience Jesus' words that it really is more blessed to give than to receive. And this now leads us to the third key, which is now save and invest. Because if you have a plan and no debt, you have more margin to save and invest. The author of Proverbs writes, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools, they gulp theirs down. Which means if you make a lot of money and then you spend all of it, biblically, you're a fool. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. I mean, that's what the author says. But a fool means someone who refuses to follow the wise things God says. I've been a fool before and I know what it feels like. You feel broke, overwhelmed, and anxious. And so the point of this proverb is that a lot of us are able to make money, we just aren't that great at keeping it. And so what we learn is that we can't out earn our inability to save. So we save and invest. Save for an emergency fund at first. 
three to six months of living expenses. And when you have that saved, you are prepared to take on some of life's biggest emergencies. And then you save and invest for the long term, for bigger purchases like homes, colleges, retirement. And here's what you'll discover. It is far better to earn interest rather than pay it. Albert Einstein once said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And the beautiful thing of saving and investing is it will earn interest. And when you keep it by saving and investing, the interest earns interest. And a lot of us, we've experienced the negative effects of this where our credit cards cause us to pay more and more on things that lose its value. When we stop paying interest and we earn it, our net worth increases more and more over time, which then really just paves the way for us to really experience what Jesus talks about. And that's the fourth key, be incredibly generous. Notice the word incredibly. This is what God wants for us because we can make incredible differences when we are able to be incredibly generous. Paul wrote a letter to a young church leader. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to rather put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. See, rich, it's not a positive or a negative term. He's just referring to those who have the ability to be incredibly generous. And God reminds us that all we have comes from him. He entrusts us to manage what he gives well. And managing well is making a difference in others through being generous. And this generosity is the generosity that decides, I can buy that single mom who's struggling a car, or I can pay off some family's lunch balance at schools. I can fund a project at church that will help many people follow Jesus. We can't do that if we're broke. We can't pay someone else's light bills when we're struggling you know, to plan to keep ours on. But if I have a plan for my finances, no debt, and I have margin, I have the ability to be incredibly generous and make a significant difference in the lives of others.